thinking of this along this theme of trying different settings, this will be our only uh, bioinformatics related talk. <laughs> okay, great. So, I'm, yeah, I'm not a theoretician, but maybe uh, you'll find the topic interesting. And as a theorist, maybe you'll see that some uh, interesting challenges are here for you to work on, and it'll be great to work together if you see anything. So, um, but first, I'm going to start with this image. Uh, this guy is in Paris spending two days searching for a needle in a haystack. Does anyone know why? <laughs> Does anyone know why it's in my slide deck? <laughs> uh, okay. A guess? Take a guess. Someone take a guess. Usually someone gets it. The size of the DNA sequence? Uh, um, oh, yeah, well, let's go. It could be related. So he's, he's in a gallery. This is like installation art. And uh, it, the gallery, he's looking literally for a needle. And the gallery is warned that it might take longer than expected. And so we're kind of faced with that when we want to do protein and small molecule design. Fundamentally, this is a search problem. And when you first look at it, you can think of it as sort of combinatorial optimization. But sort of every turn you take in trying to solve this in a real way in the wet lab and move forward, you find that it's much more nuanced than that. And so basically, this talk is going to take you through uh, that perspective of how we think about doing a protein and small molecule design uh, as some sort of an optimization problem, which uh, depends very heavily on machine learning. So why do we want to do this? So there are a lot of naturally occurring proteins that are used day to day that are super, super important. So this is a fluorescent tagging protein. You put it in, and you can see particular elements of something. This is used day to day in, in research, in pharmaceutical. It's, uh, and it, uh, I believe one of the Nobel Prizes went to that. I uh, don't remember which one. Uh, so something else, there's a protein called Rubisco, and it's sort of the rate limiting, it's involved in the rate limiting step of photosynthesis, has to do with carbon fixation, and, uh, and, and it, it, as I'll tell you, we would like potentially to optimize these and other proteins, but uh, I'm just giving you some examples of why these are really important. Something else uh, is that proteins, particular antibodies, can act as drugs, so they can bind to drug targets and sort of shut things down when they're not operating well. And I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, but um, you may have heard of CRISPR gene editing, on which I've done some, some computational work. But one of the key elements here is a protein, which are sort of the computational scissors. And they go in, and they pull apart the DNA, and they cut it. And people, and so this is also another place where proteins are really important. <clears throat> But so we'd like to actually often re-engineer these proteins that already exist, either to make them better uh, or to, for new tasks. Or we'd like to even just de novo design proteins and small molecules. So I keep saying proteins and small molecules. I'm going to anchor this talk on proteins. They're a little bit easier for reasons I'll, I'll maybe mention briefly. But the, the computational methods and challenges that I'm discussing, discussing are uh, appropriate to both. So right. So for the proteins uh, that fluoresce, we may want to change their wavelength, or we may just want to make them as intense as possible so we can see them really well. Uh, there's sort of two things that are in tension here, which are carboxylation and ox oxygenation. And if we could tweak the protein um, to somehow uh, do better on both of those, this would be really useful uh, for, for environmental reasons, for agriculture, for all kinds of things. Uh, and it's a, it's a long-standing problem on how to design better antibodies. And finally, as I said, for this CRISPR gene editing, you may want to design it so that it's more specific to the task, and there are sort of less ac accidental edits or cuts in the genome. But so in all of these cases, these are proteins. And as you may already know, proteins are represented by a sequence from an alphabet of amino acids. Um, so each of these is, is, say, a different protein, a very short protein. They're usually much longer than this. And the idea is that some of these, for example, they're, they're uh, the, actually, in this case, they're not that example, but uh, that similar. But uh, certain ones will fold. They, you know, each one has different properties. And so in some sense, we want to design a sequence that has the properties we want. And that may be several properties. Uh, I might, I'm going to focus on one property for most of this talk sort of as an abstract concept. So why is this difficult? So effectively, we're searching through some huge combinatorial space, right? And so this is really a difficult question. Are they always one? Sequence, or can we get like trees? Um, you can get things that have to interact with each other, sort of two subunits. I'm not going to go there right now. I'm going to focus on like the kind of core concept, which is the predominant one, which is a single string, which is one protein. Sometimes for a protein to function, it needs a partner, uh, and they have to somehow fit together in particular ways. But that's a, a sort of downstream. And so, obviously, this scales really badly, uh, and for for very reasonable size proteins is already like an impossible, intractable, intractable problem. So 
Uh, it's also a discrete search space, so we can't use gradients, uh, which a lot of people <coughs> use elsewhere, of course. And we're going to, at some point, use a predictive model, which is deep neural network, which is part of the reason I guess I'm speaking here. And we're going to care a lot about uncertainty in that model, which is also going to, and extrapolation. And these are both going to be very difficult challenges. So right. So the, the rest of this talk is basically me explaining to you how we're thinking about this problem as a statistical machine learning based optimization problem. And there's first, uh, there's sort of two sections. One is a little kind of first an introduction and an overview of how it's actually done in the lab right now and how at first glance you might do this computationally, which is what we actually did in our workshop paper until we thought a bit more deeply about uh, how that can go wrong. And so I'll, I'll tell you about that and then leave you with what I think are some interesting challenges. Okay, so how do people actually do this now? Uh, you may not be aware, but just last year, Francis Arnold, who's at Caltech, got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for something called directed evolution. This is the main technique that people use for protein engineering now. It has no computational component. It's a pure wet lab thing. And obviously, it works really well because it got the Nobel Prize. And so the, the name actually sort of describes already what it does. But let me take you through that to make sure you understand, because we're going to essentially build a computational analog to that. So what you do is you start with some parent protein. Imagine you care about maximizing the intensity of a protein. And so you start with one that maybe it fluoresces a little bit. And your goal is to make it fluoresce more. So what you do is you induce some diversification step. So you can think you have some starting sequence. And it's, it's actually a protein. And then you say throw x-rays at the protein. And now it's going to mutate spontaneously. And different proteins will have mutated in different ways. So you don't uh, some different number of mutations in different locations and to different letters. And so now you've induced a, a sort of variant pool of things related to the initial parent. And now what you're going to do is you're going to direct the evolution. What does that mean? You're going to essentially define the fitness function. It's not going to be survival. It's going to be whatever you want. So the, in this case of intensity, you choose those. You have to measure how uh, intense each protein is. And then you have to keep the top performing ones. And, and then you repeat the process, and you keep going. So, so that's how it's done now. And as a computational person, you can probably immediately see something that's sort of not optimal about this. So this is sort of a, a combinatorial optimization. And you're basically doing a greedy random search. And so this is probably not an effective way to move through this search space. And so that's sort of the motivation for everything I'm going to tell you about is can we move through that space um, more effectively? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace the screening step, which is typically done in a lab right, with some arduous laboratory measurement uh, about uh, the property or properties we care about or proxies to them. And so we're going to build a predictive model here, in many cases, a deep neural network. And that's going to be both good and bad. Uh, but as, as far as I'm concerned, the more interesting thing is actually replacing the random greedy search with something that's more intelligent. Uh, because there's a whole field of optimization. Maybe we can make use of this. So traditionally, when we want to predict, so I'm, right now I'm talking about uh, this, this part, replacing the assay with a predictive model. So many people have worked on these things for certain properties. And it's sort of historically, people always first predict the structure of a protein. And then they predict the function, because it's thought that structure predicts function. But actually, increasingly, there's enough data that people are now bypassing this and just going directly from sequence to the function. And so in fact, that's. I mean, we're kind of agnostic to how our predictive model works in some sense. If, some, if there's a domain where there's a good predictive model, whether it goes through here or not, we don't care. But I think generally, the field is going in this direction. So what are we going to do about this step? Right, I'm not going to talk a lot about building these models, uh, but I'm going to talk a lot about problems um, of, of the fact that we rely on these models. So how are we going to replace this random greedy search with something more intelligent? We're going to start with the predictive model I just described. And so in general, it's going to be for different properties, uh, as I mentioned. And maybe you want to maximize one, subject to that another one is above threshold. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, again, I'm going to anchor it on just maximizing one property. And you can generalize from there. So now imagine you have a predictive model. We're going to, we call this our sort of stochastic oracle. Uh, what we want to do is we want to turn it on its head, right? We want to, after it's been, we assume it's trained and it's been given to us. And in fact, we don't even care if we can see the inside or not, because this is going to be a black box optimization, because uh, it's over a discrete space. And as I said, gradients can't really help us there. But so we're going to specify the properties we want, say that this is uh, maximal, this is above some threshold. And then we want to then find the sort of inputs of the predictive model that satisfy that. And moreover, we actually want to find more than just one, because if we go back to our laboratory collaborators, uh, we want to give them a handful of good bets. And we want them to be diverse to sort of maximize the chance that we've found something useful. 
And so this is one, this is sort of where the uncertainty comes in. You can imagine that we're going to care a lot about the predictive model's uncertainty over the properties we care about. This is an example of a GP uh, where near the data it has a narrower distribution, and then as you go further away, it increases in uncertainty. So, so, I want to make sure I understand. So what is the input, really? So this, sorry, this would be a string of amino acid, from the amino acid. In your chart. Uh, in this chart, yeah, yeah. So is that the intermediate sequences? This would be, you would start with one protein sequence. So like, one of, somewhere back there. One, just one sequence like this would be the parent. You could also start with a few if you wanted to. No, but I mean in your cycle. In the cycle? Which arrow is, what's the... Yeah, is it, is, it, is it the parent or is it the intermediary? So all of these are such sequences. We start with one, and then we expand it into a pool. Yeah, in, your, in your neural network. Uh, in the neural network, OK. Yeah, so you have the property. Uh, I see. The neural network is just a, 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 a function that maps from uh, amino acid space to the properties of interest with a probability distribution over it. And in, it's abstract right now, and it will be, I'll explain how it gets used. It hasn't. Okay. But, so you have but to explain how it gets used. yeah, roughly speaking, it's the assay measurement. It's the step in the lab where you go and say, "How well did I adhere to my property?" That's basically instead of measuring it, we're going to make a call so to this. Right, so it's there in the middle. After you've got all these different mutations, yeah. now you want to know which is the best one. This is what's yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. One more thing. You said that you, you're turning it on its head, yeah. and you're trying to come up with a sequence. But yeah. is it, some sequence are infeasible? So yes. You come up with some, then this model tells you this should be the sequence. Yeah, so this is, this is one of the nuances uh, is ex like what, well, I mean, what constraints? We want also to be able to incorporate prior knowledge of constraints, which actually I'll show you how we can do that. Uh, but ideally, they, I mean, in a perfect scenario, this oracle would encode all of that. Uh, in practice, that's not usually the case. For proteins, it's relatively easy what, because any, uh, any sequence of amino acids is a valid protein. Now, it may not fold or anything like this, but by definition, it's a protein. When you get to small molecules, this is a much, much harder problem because you have to encode what is a graph structure into some sort of a string, and so you get into all kinds of other issues. So, okay, so how are we going to think about this now? I'm sort of slowly leading you through how, do we, how we think about this problem. Is given the ability to predict some property of interest, uh, such as from that neural network, say it goes from DNA or amino acid space to a property like protein fluorescence, we want, again, a method that's going to tell us what sequence to choose to, say, maximize that property. And as has just been mentioned, we also want to be able to add constraints to this design space. So maybe we know that the DNA codes for a particular protein, and that pins it down a lot. Or maybe we want to pin down the, top, the secondary structure, like the topology of the protein in a particular way, and operate only in that space. So that's the sort of formal setup of problem that we'd like to handle. And as I mentioned, this is going to be a black box stochastic oracle. Uh, partly so that we can just uh, plug and play with domain knowledge and models out there that may not be differentiable, and also because we're designing over discrete inputs here. Okay, so in the first approach, this is sort of what we decided we want to do. We were going to use some sort of black box oracle. We were going to account for uncertainty of the oracle predictive model because that's obviously very important. And then we wanted to provide a good set of candidates, not just one. Um, you can imagine you can just do gradient descent on that neural network as they do in sort of computer vision to generate images, but that's only going to give you one. You can kind of do multiple restarts and stuff, but we're actually going to take a different approach that we think is better. Uh, something, and I don't, this isn't sort of, <laughs> I don't, I have yet to find one term that uh, is commonly used across many fields, but we've started to call this model-based optimization. And I'll explain a little bit what that means. So in standard optimization, you think of some function f and you're trying to find the x that maximizes it. And x here is the space of, say, amino acid sequences. And in model-based optimization, you convert this problem into uh, one that is, in some cases, equivalent. And now, instead of searching over x, you search over the parameters of a probability distribution over x. And, uh, and when this, this distribution, if it has the capacity to put a point mass on the solution, then these are equivalent. And otherwise, they're not. As you might ask, why are we doing this? So there's some people in the audience may know, but in combinatorial optimization, um, people do this for amenability of theoretical analysis. Uh, and it's also, it's, it's related to, as I'll allude to, uh, in, in, um, in engineering disciplines, this, this model-based optimization is used for, for many reasons, including that it's black box. 
and that uh, you get this distribution of things to go give to, like, the, like that you're going to construct in the real world. And, and there's some, I think th there are other reasons I'm not going to go into, but th this is the approach we're going to take. And so this is what I mean when I say model-based optimization, where you change from searching over x to searching over a distribution over x. And so basically, we're going to iteratively change this distribution from some starting point. And at the end, we can sample x's from it. And these will be the proteins that we give to our laboratory collaborators. Does that make sense? So just as a schematic in English, uh, we call this the search model, because basically it's a distribution going through the space of, of, say, protein sequences. And it's going to move around, hopefully, into where we want to be. Once it's there, then we can sample from it. Um, but first, so it's initialized to something that's not in the right part of the space. right? If it was, then the problem would be solved. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to just sample from it. And this is kind of like this uh, diversification step, if you will, in directed evolution. Then we're going to evaluate each of those um, with our function. And, uh, and then we're going to adjust the parameters of that model so that this generative model favors sequences with large values of f of x. And that's basically how, and, and you might say, OK, well, how, how do you do this in a principled or a rigorous way where that's more likely to succeed? And of course, we're in the space of, of um, non-convex optimization. So in some sense, all bets are off, but some things work better uh, than others. So right, so these are. Uh, when we do this, the model can sample pretty broad areas of sequence space. Uh, it does not require the gradients of f, so we get this black box. We can incorporate uncertainty into here if we actually um, use the predictive model and its uh, conditional its, uh, CDF. Uh, and we get, again, we get more than one candidate here. And we can also use the tools of probabilistic modeling, which is going to turn out to be very useful um, in the second round of this. OK, so the, this model-based optimization objective then is we're going to actually put a log out here. And we're going to now, this is going to be like the stochastic oracle. And it's going to say something. What this means is the probability that the intensity of the fluorescence is higher or equal than the maximum. So in other words, we're looking for the maximum. And we want to find the distribution that does that. And so this is sort of the core beast of what we would like to solve right now. Um, and so this is, again, what we call the search model. And so uh, you could, this could be, if we're in discrete space, it could be like an HMM. We've been using variational autoencoders. We haven't yet done our due diligence on what the best thing would be here. Uh, and then again, this is the desired set of property values. For example, that the fluorescence is greater than some threshold, which could be the maximum. And then we have this stochastic predictive model, which for uh, this, this workshop, you can think of as a deep neural network right? that goes from amino acid sequences to the property we care about. And because this is the CDF, it accounts for the uncertainty. Uh, and it's also going to help us uh, in the optimization, as you'll see, hopefully. <laughs> so there are two issues with this thing. Uh, the first is that we're doing an optimization over some uh, parameter that appears in the expectation distribution. So this is like a very common problem in machine learning when you see in the uh, very, like, so there's the reparameterization trick and a number of other things that people use to get around this. And we're going to do it in, in our own way. So we're going to. Uh, basically lower bound it, although I'm not going to go into the details here, but the, the bound will actually be satiated. And this allows us to move the parameter. This is now no longer a parameter that we're solving for. It's the previous parameter in an iterative process, and so it's no longer problematic. Uh, the parameter we're optimizing over now only lies over here. Uh, and now the other problem, and this is one that's much less common that I've seen in, in machine learning as compared to this one, is that we're doing essentially, we're drawing samples. And so this is a Monte Carlo estimate. And it's a rare event estimate also, which makes this really, really difficult. And so what I mean by that is initially we draw samples from the search model. And by definition, we're not in the right part of the space. And therefore, the probability that this is high, like that, it's, that it satisfies our desired property is actually uh, quite low. What that means is this is sort of the effective sample size. And so because it's a rare event, we're doing a Monte Carlo estimate with a really small number of samples, even if we take a large number, just because the weights are so small, because it's weighted by how well it adheres to the property we care about. Does that make sense? Um, and so what we're going to do to solve that problem, and we've taken inspiration from a, an area called the cross entropy method, is to anneal a sequence of relaxations. Um, and so here, instead of saying that we have to satisfy the criteria, like the intensity has to be the maximum, we're going to slowly ramp it up. So we're going to actually start with an intensity we've seen and then slowly increase this towards what we hope is the maximum. But, but there's no guarantees here. Um, so 
Right. So overall, what happens is it's, a, it's an iterative process where you sample from the search distribution. And once you've done that, then you find the next uh, parameter using what just looks like weighted maximum likelihood and where the weights are basically how well it adheres to the current annealed version of the property you care about. OK, so th this is actually very intuitive. You can you know, get down into the details, but, on a, but I want to just draw the very clean and intuitive analogy between what I've described and actually directed evolution, the wet lab method. And so this is a sort of pseudocode where this is with a stochastic oracle. This is its expectation and its CDF, so we can account for uncertainty. And this is what we require for our method. So this would be something like, I require a method in the laboratory to measure the property I care about. Then we have a generative model, uh, which takes a set of weighted samples. And so this could be like a variational autoencoder, an HMM, uh, what have you. And once given these samples, it, it, can, it uh, trains itself, and then you can sample from it. So this is like throwing x-rays at the parent and generating uh, versions of it that are different. And uh, you can initialize it as you, as you do in directed evolution. You could give it a single sequence. You could also, in principle, give it no sequence, or you could give it a set of sequences. Um, and now what we're going to do is right, just take care of if it's, if it's already been initialized, then just use those. And otherwise, randomly initialize it and set all the weights to uniform. So basically, this is just starting with a parent or a set of parents and treating them all equally. And then we're going to iterate as you do in directed evolution. So we're going to take the uh, first, we're going to generate samples. So this is, again, like uh, throwing these x-rays at the parents and generating a new set of things. And now what we're going to do is we're going to score them according to how well they uh, adhere to the property we care about. And I'm not going to go through the details here, but basically you end up weighting each sample by both how well it does and accounting for its uncertainty as well. And then as we go through this, uh, you, you basically have this very similar thing to directed evolution. And we, we're hoping that we can do better in some particular sweet spots of biotechnology, which I can talk a little bit what that means. What is a sweet spot? Where can we apply this? Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. And I just want to point out that actually we didn't know this at the time, and it's been very interesting getting into this space. So as far as I know, most people in machine learning have not heard about estimation of distribution algorithms. This is like a huge, huge body of literature that is really widely used. Um, and it turns out we kind of reinvented this in some way. Um, and, and I was always taught in grad school that evolutionary algorithms were you know, to be kind of mocked and laughed. And what's interesting, though, this is kind of modern day equivalent to this, and where people now have replaced this. Uh, you've probably heard of these sort of genetic uh, optimization algorithms. You have these like, kind of weird mutations and crossovers. And this has now um, been, at least as we've done it, been sort of incorporated into a proper statistical framework, although um, in 95, Rich and uh, Corona and Baluja sort of first uh, grabbed onto this idea of replacing kind of these weird <laughs> mutation and crossover events with probability distributions that capture regularities about the space. And instead of just doing mutations randomly, they're actually doing it like this precisely why this will work better is that you're replacing these weird operations with stuff um, in a generative model that under hopefully <laughs> understands the space better and the correlation between the amino acids in this, in this frame. And as I mentioned, the, this technique is also related to this cross-entropy method, which is originally for rare event estimation. I may probably the theoreticians here have heard of this, and was actually later uh, sort of generalized to do uh, maximization uh, for combinatorial, sorry, combinatorial optimization as well. And sort of the most common EDA is something called, uh, if you're interested in the topic, is the covariance matrix adaptation uh, evolutionary strategy. And this is, if you search this on Google, you'll see this is like super, super widely used stuff that our community doesn't seem to, to know about, but is actually using. And I'll point out there's some connections of these methods to reinforcement learning and also to um, image generation. And so actually, actually, we've just released a preprint here where we have, I believe, for the first time shown that these can actually be written as variational expectation maximization which is pretty astonishing that no one, I think, saw this connection yet. We're, we're trying to leverage this connection to actually make it uh, work better. But in the meantime, I think it's a really interesting intellectual contribution. But I'm not going to talk more about that. How much time do I have left? Uh, we have about 20 minutes. 20 minutes, OK. Right. And so I'm, I just mentioned this, but these methods are actually, you can sort of not on the surface when you look at the motivation. But if you go under the hood, and so actually Sergey, I don't know if Sergey's still here. Sergey Levine, um, one of my colleagues and I, started to talk quite a bit because in terms of the underlying um, technical problems here, there's a lot to be shared. So we don't have any notion of dynamics in a real world. But the optimization you get when you're searching for a policy in reinforcement learning, there's a, there's a very, very similar techniques between what we're doing and what they're doing. 
um, and many of the challenges as well, which is uh, I'll tell you a little bit about. And then the other thing it's related to is image generation. So you've probably seen these things of like take a network and I want to know what an apple looks like or I want to know what a bird looks like or I want to create a man with glasses <laughs> or without glasses. And these techniques are also um, can be used here and some of the challenges are similar as well. I'm not going to talk more about those. Okay, so what I just described was our first sort of stab at saying how can we do a sort of in silico computational protein design. But something here, and we, we thought very clever, we account for uncertainty, like we're ready to go, let's work with the lab. So what's, what's going to go wrong? Uh, usually someone gets this too, an idea. Maybe what uh, Sammy was saying. What's that? Sammy was saying, what, what did Sammy want? say? I forget. The stuff, the stuff that you want doesn't come up when you this, shoot the fluorescent at the... Uh, the stuff that you want, you mean you don't move to the right part of the space somehow? Or, you don't or some, sequences. Oh, the constraints. Oh, the constraints. Yeah, so one problem is the constraints. But sort of from, and, uh, and we can incorporate those into the framework I just described. Um, but sort of, I think the main problem is actually that we've assumed the stochastic oracle is unbiased and has calibrated uncertainty estimates. Uh, and so what, does everyone here know what calibrated uncertainty estimates are? So just to be sure, like if you have a classifier and I tell you it's 0.8% a, a cat, then it better be that if I have 100 things with a score of 0.8 cats, then precisely 80% of them are cats. And if that's not true, then it's not calibrated. And the less true it is, the less calibrated. And there's an analog for regression, and we're doing regression here. Uh, but it's easier to think about the classification. So what really it means is, do these error bars have meaning? And all our experiments in that preprint assumed that they were calibrated because you know you always hear, for example, in the Gaussian process, people talking about their lovely uncertainty estimates. But as you may realize, the further away you go from the training data, uh, the more biased essentially the model is, right? Like kind of like you, like you can't extrapolate indefinitely. And so at some point, you have a biased model. And if you have a biased model, then by definition, the uncertainty is not calibrated. And so you're kind of totally screwed. And if you do what we did, you're just going to go into uh, weird parts of the space. And so, and more specifically, if you're using a neural network, then there's all these crazy weird pathologies that people now know about and are, are trying to understand and trying to fix in, in strange ad hoc ways. And these are going to affect us really, really badly, right? So if you kind of have these black holes in your model and you're optimizing it, you're going to probably fall into one of these black holes because it's some total pathology that tells you your protein intensity is super high. And in fact, it's just some garbage black hole. And what, what do I mean by black hole? So it's this, you know, there's different ways to demonstrate this. One is you take this tiny amount of noise you get in a particular way by following the gradient, and you add it to an image, and suddenly it turns into like a yield sign even though perceptually it looks identical, right? So we've all seen lots of these examples, but I can't resist. I'm going to show you a few anyway because I really like them. In this case, you have a panda. Just add this tiny little bit of noise. It still perceptually looks like a panda, but now with 99% confidence it's actually a gibbon. This is what a gibbon looks like. Um, and then this one sort of is, <laughs> is pretty good. So all the images in yellow here have a greater than 50% chance of being an airplane, according to like a uh, a neural network model. And so obviously, if we're dealing with models like this, and we do this kind of thing where we start with a, one of these models that's trained, it has these weird black holes. And then uh, we know this from sort of image generation, right? People say, what does a banana look like in a trained network? They propagate, they propagate the gradients back and iteratively update x. And then you get this kind of weird stuff. And it's precisely because these neural networks really don't understand what's going on. So then if you're in the image generation game, you add you add constraints, essentially. You put in prior knowledge to coerce it to something that doesn't look like this. But obviously, if we do something similar, we're going to end up in some garbage part of the space as well. And so the fundamental problem is, how can we adapt what we've done to somehow account for this? And I, I think it's actually an impossible problem. Uh, but sort of all real problems are impossible. And we'd just like to make as much progress as we can and do better than you know, directed evolution, which just got the Nobel Prize, or work synergistically with it, of course. And I should mention, usually by now I have a question that says, like, why isn't this just Bayesian optimization so, or something like that, where you're dynamically trying to learn a function? So these are related, but they're also different. So in, in, if you're wondering this, just for those people, in Bayesian optimization, every call to the function is considered to be very expensive. And you're trying to, in an online manner, decide how to trade off exploration and exploitation to find the next very expensive call. Here, we're assuming these calls are actually pretty cheap. And so it's not, it's not, although there's relationship between these, this isn't, I would say, this is the setup is not Bayesian optimization. 
Uh, so right, so now the second pass through is we keep the same goals we had before and we add this fourth one, which is account for the fact that the oracle may be arbitrarily biased or pathological in parts of the space. Okay, so now, now what do we do? In normal evolution, this uh, fake banana would not survive because it couldn't actually yeah. produce new bananas. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I suppose you need something similar in your setting that could yeah. remove the fake bananas. Yes, yes. <laughs> that w that's exactly right. Uh, yes, 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 exactly. Um, so we're going to uh, actually, so David, uh, David Brooks is my first PhD student. We've been doing all this work together. He and I think about this very differently. Um, if, he, if, if he tells you what his, the solution is, he'll describe it one way, and he'll say you just need, a you need to estimate a conditional density. And what I'll tell you is you need to be Bayesian, and they're actually the same thing. But so I'll give you the Bayesian flavor. Um, so what we're going to do is, is say that imagine we have the data that our predictive model was built on. Uh, that is pairs of x and y, even though we don't require it. So there's two settings. In one case, we've, we're given this. In the other, I'll tell you what we do then. But imagine we're given this. Um, then basically, what we want is we want to use that data to tell us where we believe that our stochastic oracle is trustworthy. And basically, all we can believe is that it's trustworthy near the training data. It's not some profound uh, insight, but it's also uh, a matter of even just incorporating this. And I would argue that the framework we've built, because it uses this probability model as the search model, you can sort of naturally incorporate it. But in any case, uh, this gives us prior knowledge of where we can trust the model and where the probability of y given x is likely to be accurate. Um, so, how, so basically what we want to do is estimate the density of the x's from the tr of, that were in the training data and bring that into the method. And, and this somehow tells us this is where we expect input space to be trustworthy for the stochastic oracle. Does that make sense? Of course, uh, I'm going to gloss over, but it requires that this itself is a good estimate. And there could be problems there, although I think in our experience, this is much less problematic than that. So right. Um, if we don't have access to those data, then we really become Bayesian, and we basically just say, what distribution of x's do we trust? And, and by being, when I say being Bayesian, I mean like we're really going to just bring to bear prior knowledge. So for the example, in protein space, we might say, we, we know that like, we can download online a list of all proteins that are able to fold. And this would be almost the main constraint here. Like That's the thing that's most likely to go wrong, is you spit out a protein that can't even fold. If it can't fold, for most purposes, it's not functional. And so you could say, well, what if we could just get it to fold? And so maybe what we do is we give it all proteins that can fold, and we learn a density over those. And instead of the density of the training data, we use that. And so, or you could imagine some mix and match of empirical base from the training data plus adding in prior knowledge. Okay, so what do we do with the prior? We just use it um, with the oracle to get the joint, essentially. So this is the oracle probability of the property we care about given the amino acid sequence. We just add in uh, this new probability over the space that we consider trustworthy, and that gives us the joint, which is proportional to the, this conditional density, and this is why David likes to describe it as a conditional density. And so now the game is actually to estimate this conditional density. And we're going to use similar techniques to what I described, uh, but it's a little bit different. Uh, as I'll, I'll sort of do an outline of that. So, but one way to think about this is you start with a reasonable distribution of proteins, um, either from the draining data or from your prior knowledge. And then you want to condition on the event that you want. So for example, x given that y is greater than y max, that the intensity is, is very high. And so an illustrative example of this in, in our ICML paper is you start with, uh, this is a little confusing because the axis is two purposes. Um, so this is the training distribution. So this is actually just a density, P of x. And this uh, ground truth is the actual uh, true probability, uh, or, or true y for each x. And um, so in this case, uh, we have an oracle. Uh, getting confused with my own plots here, but right. So in this case, right, this is the ground truth, but we build an oracle, right? And the oracle is never perfect. And in this, this is one version of an oracle. It's, um, it's pretty certain, as you can see, by its narrow uncertainty. In this case, it's much larger than this. And, um, and in this case, uh, the ground truth coincides the peak roughly with the oracle. And so if you maximize the oracle, you're going to be OK. 
Um, there's not a problem. But this is the sort of thing I've been talking about is these pathologies. And of course, this is projected into a slide, which is one dimensional, so it's not actually representative of the crazy pathologies. But in this case, the oracle we build, it just keeps going up. And so it's going to be nowhere near the ground truth. And so the idea is if we incorporate this prior knowledge, and of course, this is just a schematic illustrative example of what we hope we can accomplish, then um, we can now get, an, uh, get it to, sorry. In this case, it, what's going on there? Um, right, and in this case, instead of it going crazy like this, we basically add in the, the P of X, which uh, reigns it in. And so it, it doesn't align exactly with the maximum, but at least it prevents us basically from going to crazy parts of the space. Uh, I don't know if this example helped now that I'm actually presenting it. All that is to say is, again, that this adding this distribution P of X should hopefully coerce it to stay closer to the area that we trust. Um, and so I, I mentioned sort of, the, I did an outline of how we solve. The distribution of a, so this is the data that, of the folding proteins, for example. Uh, for example, yes, yeah. And so, right, so but again, just the main idea from everything I just said is to include this extra P of X in there. And when you do that and you go through this here, um, you want to solve this conditional density. And so that's exactly the setup. So there's this conditional density that we would like uh, to estimate. This one here, sorry, probability of X given, sorry, this one here. This is the property we care about. We would like to estimate that. And we're going to do that by using this distribution and changing theta to approximate it and minimizing the KL divergence. So I'm not going to go through all the technical details of that, but the methods are, are a little bit similar, but you get something that modulates the weights, which accounts for this prior knowledge, basically. It ends up in the weighting scheme of the weighted maximum likelihood. Um, how much time do I have now? 10. 10? Okay. So the, the thing that's really hard about this compared to most machine learning problems is in most machine learning problems that like it, prediction of some kind, classification, regression, you can just hold out part of the data and then you can see how well you do. And you know, if you're doing domain adaptation and transfer learning, maybe like it's a bit more complicated, but you can always just kind of hold it out and see what's going on. And in this case, it's really fundamentally hard, sort of as it is in, in combinatorial optimization, but it's even harder here for us to test this than in combinatorial optimization because we have this stochastic oracle that we know has pathologies in it and we don't know where they are. And so it's really, really, hard to do in silico experiments for this. So we've done the best we can, but we have a number of wet lab collaborations where we're going to actually see if we can get somewhere with this. Um, but so we have to actually simulate a ground truth. And we're going to do that uh, with a, a GP mean, a, ground, a Gaussian process mean function. And then that is now our ground truth, which we need and you don't usually do. And then from that, we can basically sample what we consider to be observed corrupt data and then build models on top of it. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing we want to do is we want to right, give it just part, like the, the lower part uh, of the data, the lower part of the intensity, let's say, and hide it from the high intensity stuff. So this is also different, right? We're sort of truncating the space in some particular way. And anyway, when we do that, then we can do some simulations. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of of what emerges, but I'll just say that there's, there are a suite of methods you can use here, some of which we've developed or, or some are generalizations or specific instantiations of other things you could think to use. And in the end, they're all very similar in that you generate samples from a generative model, and then you do a weighted maximum likelihood update, and the weights are just all different um, for these. And, and, and that's kind of how these things are different from, from each other. And then we also tested against some gradient-based methods. And this is, again, what people in image generation do, right? They take a neural network, and they fix the output that says, like, show me a banana. And then they, they use gradients to optimize the inputs. So I'm not going to go into all these details, I think. But uh, I'll just say that so this is kind of where we're at now. We've introduced a new model-based optimization that accounts for uncertainty in the oracle and is hopefully to some extent robust to these pathologies. But I think this is one of the sort of open challenges for us is how to do that. And I'll say a bit more in a second. Um, but right now, we're also in parallel. So we're developing these methods um, and, and publishing them as more technical papers. But we have a number of collaborations where we're doing this w with a wet lab, so at UW for protein binding instability. There's a, a really wonderful guy, David Schaefer, here at Berkeley who does gene delivery, like trying to get proteins in a particular part of the eye to cure 
certain forms of blindness and getting the protein to the right space requires designing um, that protein in a very particular way. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're starting also to work on small molecule design with a pre-competitive consortium called Atom. And there's also uh, some interesting organic synthetic chemistry here. But so what maybe, maybe what is in it for the theoreticians in the room who think there might be interesting problems here. So one thing that's been interesting to me is to think about extrapolation. So we're taking an oracle, and we know we want to extrapolate, right? We're trying to do maximization. And so by definition, we're extrapolating. And so I remember, I, was, I don't know if Peter's still here. I was trying to understand what theoretical results were understood about this. And I went into Peter Bartlett's office, and, and, and I said something about extrapolation. And he said, what's that? <laughs> I said, thank you. I, no one else has given me this answer, and I think it's the right answer. He's like, what is extrapolation? You know, you show it in whatever, in grade school or whatever, uh, in introductory math, like this thing like this, where you have data and extrapolations out here. But what is out here, and how do you define that crisply? If someone knows, I would really like to to know the answer. I have yet to be given any reasonable answer to this. Uh, and I think for us, it's, un it's, it's very important to understand, actually, crisply what that means and how can we practically use that definition. I think it may guide us in particular ways. Um, so the other thing is, is how can we, essentially what we're doing is like a particular form of domain adaptation, right, which is for maximization. And that's a very specific one. And I don't know if people have ever, uh, if you're aware of work where people have done it just for that purpose, I'd like to, to know about that. But and also, moreover, a lot of that work's not sort of geared towards uh, deep to neural networks and their weird pathologies and things like this. So I think that's another interesting problem is how, how to do that. And then beyond that, this is one that I think is typically overlooked, is people do all these things to make models better, but they don't really look carefully at when the uncertainty is calibrated and when you can trust them. And we really, really care about that, because we're just going to go completely wrong if we don't know how far to trust the model. So this is super, super important to us. In fact, we'd rather err on the side of being conservative and, tr and, and trust, having that trust region too small, because otherwise we're just going to get crazy stuff and our, our collaborators are going to walk away. Um, and then I've mentioned this. So we, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the work on deep neural networks and calibration of uncertainty. I'd say these are sort of two of my favorite papers, and, but I, I think they're sort of the beginning of the story. It's not a new story, right? People, the statisticians especially, have been working on calibration for decades, but we have yet to find very practical, useful things for that purpose. And so I think there's a lot of interesting work there as well. So, and I'll just thank uh, my... Uh, my colleagues, or so David is my first student. He's really, um, he and I have been driving these projects, everything I mentioned here, all three of these. And Acosta and Clara uh, are in my group as well. And I didn't talk about the last paper, this relationship to expectation maximization, as well as Kevin. And Hanbum's a protein scientist at UW who helped us a bit with the fluorescence. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Why do you do evolution when you can do intelligent design? <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's sort of one and the same, so right? Like that's a that's a. Why is this molecule fluorescent and and go from the understanding? Yeah. To kind of evolutionary, random... Well, you can, in, you can actually do both with this, right? So to the extent you understand it, you can encode this understanding in an oracle, and we can absorb that. So, and it's one reason I like this, is I don't want to like, be in this like, position of like, no, no, we don't need... I want to take as much outside knowledge as we can and as much mechanistic understanding. But people have been chasing this for decades, and it's largely unsolved. And so, yeah, that would be great. I think if you, you know, if there's like a million dollar contest of who's going to get this protein, I think this is going to win over that on average for all problems. There may be particular problems for which there is good knowledge, but we'd like part of this is to precisely go beyond that. And so, in fact, David Baker's lab at the University of Washington, they're like the, you know, sort of leaders in the field of particular protein things that are very, very related to structure and free energy and doing physics-based simulations. But there's a, there are many properties for which this isn't going to get you very far. And so, yeah, if, you, if you're in those niche areas, then you're right. And in general, this would be lovely, but I think this is a long way out. And I think the best you can do is actually develop methods. And I think it's like probabilistic ones where you can coherently incorporate this into the method. Regarding adversarial examples, I'm not sure that this setting will actually go around them. My design adversarial examples are going to be not the average example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the, the worst case. Right, sorry, uh, yes, I don't think we have a problem of adversarial examples. The reason I put that there, because I think they're sort of a very uh, nice way to highlight pathologies of the model. It says that there's parts of the space the model just doesn't understand, and yet we may not hit those, but there are lots of these holes, and, and you can see them easily in this way, so it's sort of a very nice visual striking way to understand crazy pathologies, and you're right, like, there's not an adverse, I mean, it's unlikely there's an adversary uh, in our system, but uh, the same pathologies that allow... Your approach will try yeah. to find out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, not adversarially, just sort of accidentally pre because it's these sort of like black holes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right. Is there any connection between Laplace gradient if you think of the Oracle as the uh, value function? Yeah, yeah, there's a very direct connection to policy gradient, absolutely, uh, except we don't have the dynamics again. Okay. Yeah. Have you taken any of the uh, proteins that were engineered with the directed evolution and tried to reconstruct them? In so the, it's really early days um, for us. We have, we have all, these are just budding collaborations. We have not yet actually tested anything in the lab. Um, yeah. okay, let's take the speaker again.